We've been teaching on what it means to walk in the Spirit the last few weeks. And uh, the desire to teach on that started by a desire to confront the world around us um, not with the weapons of our flesh, but with the weapons that God has given us in the spiritual realm. At no time in history have we been confronted with things that are so troubling, uh, that stir us up so much, that make us so anxious. And as we said two weeks ago, we can get drawn into this conflict or into this battle that really isn't ours to get drawn into as Christians. We're at least called to fight it a different way. Paul said in Ephesians 6, 12, that we wage war not against flesh and blood, not against principalities, uh, or, but against principalities and powers of darkness. We don't wage war against ideologies. As Christians, we wage war in another realm. And then Paul said in 1 Corinthians that the weapons that we fight with are not carnal, but they're mighty. Everybody say mighty. 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 They're not wimpy. They're not weeny. They are mighty through God for the pulling down of those strongholds. And so if we are engaged in a battle, then we have to fight the battle effectively. And if we're going to win this battle that we have all been drawn into over the last few months, we have to fight it in the spirit instead of fighting it in our flesh. And so if we're going to fight the battle in the spirit, we have to walk in the spirit. What does that mean? If you weren't here last week, you can log on to our YouTube channel and just kind of get, I gave a quick review of what it means to walk in the spirit. And the reason I did that is there's, um, there's some anxiousness that people have when we talk about being filled with the spirit or continually filled with the spirit. And so I want you to understand what that means uh, according to the Bible. So go back and you can listen to that message. It's on our YouTube channel. But we talked about what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And then we said that walking in the Spirit begins first by walking in the realm of prayer. Walking in the realm of prayer. A.W. Tozer said, One miraculous answer to prayer would do more to help the congregation and encourage and cheer it up and cause it to lift up the hands that hang down and strengthen the feeble knees than all the advertising you could do in the wide world. One miraculous answer to prayer would do more to encourage the house of God than anything else, right? Do you believe that? Can I hear an amen? Amen. And you'll never get an answer if you don't pray. The answer's always no until you ask, right? Amen. If we don't ask him, then we're not going to see those answers. Man, this week, uh, the church is open 7 to 7 every day just to pray. If you're anxious, if you're upset, if you're stirred in your mind and your will and your emotions, I can make one promise to you this morning. You go into that room and you pray for an hour, you're going to come out a different person. I promise you that. You will come out as you just surrender those things to the Lord and you ask him, remember we said what prayer is, we're exchanging our desires for his. You go into that room and you ask God for that exchange, you'll come out thinking differently, you'll come out happier, you'll come out with more confidence and more hope. What the world needs now isn't love, love, love. What the world needs now first is prayer, prayer, prayer. That's walking in the realm of the Spirit. Just over the last two weeks as we have been in the sanctuary, diff different people, as I've been in the sanctuary, just praying by myself, praying with people, you, man, I've just seen the hand of God move in individuals' lives. Without prayer, seven days without prayer makes one week, right? Not W-E-A-K, but no, W-E-E-K, but W-E-A-K. Seven days without prayer makes one week. Walking in the Spirit begins... The walking in the realm of prayer. Last week we talked about walking in the spirit is uh, about walking in the realm of our divine appointments. A divine appointment is where God orchestrates an encounter with you and another person or person. Sometimes it's more than one. To reveal something about his kingdom to them. In the New Testament, often the divine appointments were in the form of miracles. Somebody was sick. In some cases, they had died. They needed direction. 
and first with Jesus and later with the disciples, they would have these divine appointments or these divine encounters with those people and they would be healed immediately. That's the kind of divine appointment that is so awesome. But it's not just healings. God will use us to speak words of encouragement to other people, give them words of hope, uh, prophetic words, words of direction. And so God wants to give each of us in this room divine appointments, divine opportunity, opportunities, divine encounters to share with other people things about God's kingdom, his love for them. Last week we talked about three things that God uses to give us or open the door up for those divine appointments. First, he uses our passions. My friend Scott here is passionate about fishing. Uh, I mean, he lives to fish. And uh, because of that, God has given you all kinds of opportunities to share with other people about Jesus. You're good at it. It's a desire that you have. And so in this room, there's all kinds of different desires that are represented. One person likes to ride a motorcycle. One person likes to work on cars. Another person likes to do crafts. Another person likes to invest or flip houses. Another person has this talent or that trade. And God uses all of our desires to open up opportunities for our divine appointments. He also uses our positions. He puts us in places where he knows where we're going to be and he knows someone else is going to be and he links the two together and he says, okay, now I want you to share with that person. He uses our geographical positions. He also uses our circumstantial positions, doesn't he? You're a business owner. You're working on somebody's car. You're working on somebody's house. You're working on somebody's taxes. You're in your market selling food or groceries or whatever it is. You're a business owner, and God uses you in that circumstantial position to share something about his kingdom with someone who comes your way. And thirdly, we said last week that God uses our possessions. Who has a God like us that he would give you that possession that you've wanted all your life, that house, that toy, that thing. He blesses you with those things, and then he uses those things to bless another. Lord, we surrender our things, our vessels to you, don't we? We want those divine appointments. This morning, I want to share with you four examples of divine appointments from the Bible if I get that far. So I'm going to get right into it. The first is in Acts 16 when Paul was in Philippi. Most of you know the story, but I'll retell it. Paul was traveling around. This was his second missionary journey. He was with Silas. He was also at least with Timothy. There was probably some other people that were there. And sometimes they were on a ship sailing. At other times they were walking on the land. And he... Uh, just gets off the ship and they make their way to Philippi. We don't know that Paul had ever been there before. It might have been a new city to him. But the Bible says that he'd been there some days, a few days, and that on this particular day, it was a Saturday. A Saturday for a Jew is like a Sunday for us. That was their day of worship. It was the day they went to the synagogue. It was their day of rest. So uh, Paul is in this new city. He doesn't know anybody. Uh, often he would go to the synagogue and he would find people to interact with. But on this day, the Bible says that he went to the river to pray. Not to fish, but to pray. You could say that he went to the river to fish. You could say that fishing on the Sabbath and fishing on the Sunday is in the Bible. You could say that if you wanted to. I'm not saying that, but Scott, you could make that case. So he goes, he goes to the river really to pray, to get away from people. If he wanted to get, get around people, he would have went to the synagogue. But in this case... He goes to the river, right? He's not thinking divine appointment at this point. He's thinking, I'm going to talk to my creator. But he gets to the river and he encounters this lady. And he begins to talk to her. Her name was Lydia. And he leads her to faith in Jesus. He's by a river, so you might as well baptize her, right? So he <laughs> baptizes Lydia in the river. Lydia invites Paul to her house. Paul meets the rest of her family. He leads all of them to faith in Jesus, and they are baptized, and that's his divine appointment. Now, how awesome would that be if you, you 
you're just trying to get away and you're going to go to Starbucks and have a cup of coffee before church or a latte or whatever it is that you drink and you're there and you're trying to get alone and instead of having that cup of coffee you end up sharing the gospel with somebody and they become Christians and then they invite you to their house and you go to their house and you share Jesus with everyone in the house and they all become saved. Could you imagine what kind of an awesome divine appointment that would be? That would be a shock, wouldn't it? But you guys know the story. That's only half of the story because Lydia, this woman, was an extremely wealthy and successful businesswoman. And because of her encounter with Paul, Paul had blessed her, she went on to bless Paul for the rest of his ministry financially. Craig Gotelli and Val were sharing a couple of weeks ago on this. Val was sharing how she meets a lady on a plane and she sits down beside her and begins to tell her story. They're missionaries in Sri Lanka. And she tells her story and that divine appointment, that, that encounter with that woman has led to that individual supporting Craig and Val almost monthly from that moment on. She benefited from that divine appointment. Paul benefited from that divine appointment. If I could promise you that you would always benefit from your divine appointment, would you not begin to seek them out? I mean, you'd be like, who's next? Mm -hmm. I, need, I need some support. I need some of this. And, uh, I could use another client. I could use another job. You'd just begin to look for divine appointments if I could tell you that you benefit every time you are obedient to those things, right? I'm here to tell you you benefit every time you're obedient to those things. You benefit. Sometimes you just benefit by your faith growing. We've all taken those steps of faith. We did, we did something we've never done before, and we take that step, and God shows up, and it's, you just think, that's the coolest thing in the world. I, I'm going to do that again. And you take another step, and you take another step. Your faith grows as you take those steps of obedience. And sometimes... Those divine appointments that you have with people, you share that thing, you say that thing, you invite them somewhere, you pray over them. You know, you don't see anything other, any, anything else happen other than your faith grows. And as your faith grows, your confidence grows. Like, I'm going to do that again. There are people in our services today who have never taken a step of faith in regards to a divine appointment. It's not because you don't love God or you don't trust God, it's because you're scared to death to say something. Anybody say, yeah, that's me. I, I, got, I don't, I'm just, I'm just afraid. I, I wouldn't say anything to anyone at a duck game. You know, I've shared this analogy before. We used to have season tickets to the basketball team forever. And, you know, they'd, there'd be this great play and the place would erupt and people were high-fiving people four and five rows back and then you'd see some little guy just sitting there with his hands folded and he loved the ducks it just wasn't his thing right so there are people in this room you're just afraid to you're afraid to step out so i want to invite you i want to encourage you god has divine appointments for you and as you step out in faith your confidence grows and then you do it again and your confidence grows again and pretty soon you're looking for a divine appointment twice a year or four times a year or once a month. This is a new thing for you. We're just trying to grow in our faith, right, church? Our faith grows, our confidence grows, and then our capacity grows. The more you do it, the more you're open for God just to fill you. If you're a basketball coach and you have that kid on your team that he just wants the ball at the end of the game, and every time he gets the ball at the end of the game, he makes he makes a good decision. I mean, he's just made for that, right, Gene? He, he, if you're a coach and you have that kid on your team as a coach, you're going to get the ball to him. It's like we're going to run a play and it's going to Joey. It's going. Let's get the ball to. That's just how it is. If you have an employee that works for you and they're hungry. They're responsible, they're tried and true men, you'll just give them more opportunities, right? 
that you want to increase their capacity. That's how God is with us. We step out in faith and we grow in our confidence. Man, he's like, let me give you more. Let me give you more. Let me give you more. God just wants to pour those things out into you. You may think that you're timid. Paul says you don't have a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and soundness of mind. That's who you are in Christ Jesus. I'm not saying that you have to be type A. I'm not saying you have to be loud, but I am saying you can be bold. And wouldn't that be wonderful? Because nobody likes being timid. Nobody likes that feeling like, I wish I could say something, but I just can't do it. Nobody likes that. We want to have boldness, and that's what you were created for. You benefit every time. Sometimes your capacity grows. Sometimes your confidence grows. Sometimes you even get something financial. But we always benefit. The second story out of the Bible I want to tell you um, about is... In Acts 6 and Acts 8 with Philip. Acts 6 tells the story of when Philip became a deacon in the church in Jerusalem. I want to just tell you a little bit about the church in Jerusalem when it first started. This is right after the death and the resurrection of Jesus. The disciples and that group of 120 are waiting on the Lord. The Holy Spirit falls on them. And all of a sudden the world in Jerusalem is just turned upside down. And they begin to talk about Jesus, and the tomb is empty, and they begin to pray for people, and supernatural things are happening, and that church just explodes. Thousands of people are coming to faith all of the time. Thousands were added in one day, and the Bible says that people were added to the church every day. Can you imagine being a part of a church like that? When I get to heaven... There's a lot of Netflix documentaries that I want to see uh, in regards to the Old Testament. But the one they're making right now about the church in Jerusalem, that's the one I want to see. I mean, there were just some cool things happening. And the Bible says that they had everything in common. It says they were bringing their possessions. People were bringing all their possessions and just laying them at the apostles or the disciples' feet. So you had this great, big, huge pile of resources over here. And then... You had this big pile of needs over here, and then you had these thousands of people come into faith that needed to be baptized and discipled that are really kind of in the middle. And the apostles are like, we just can't do it all. We can't keep up. <clears throat> and so they appointed, they dedicated, they set aside prayerfully seven guys to be deacons in that church who were going to take care of the needs, the provisions, and and match the provisions with the needs and all of those other things. And so, uh, but those seven guys weren't just administrators. They were men who the Bible says were full of the Holy Spirit and they were praying for people and they were seeing supernatural things happen in their lives. And, and if you, if, if that were happening today, those seven guys would be famous. I mean, they would be out telling their stories and writing books. I was looking online earlier this week if, if you're on staff at a mega church in America, you're writing books and famous. That's just how it is. And those guys, they had this high position. It was prestigious. It was high profile. Everybody knew who those deacons were. That was Philip's first divine appointment. I'll take it. <laughs> That's pretty cool, isn't it? But you know the story. Persecution came. The church scattered. Philip went to Samaria. After he was in Samaria... The Holy Spirit led him to go to Gaza, a town that's over on the coast. And while he was on his way to Gaza, Philip had his next divine appointment or encounter that we see in the Bible. He was called to share the gospel with the Ethiopian eunuch. You know what a eunuch is? A eunuch is somebody who's been eunuched, and it's not nice. <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> it's a male who's been castrated. And in antiquity, parents would actually take their sons and have them eunuch so they could serve in places of honor. They could serve with kings and queens and royalty and people that had great wealth because those people in those positions required that. Gonna work for me, you're gonna be eunuchs. The reason they, they went through that process is if they were over the women of the house and 
You know, again, it's just history. Those, those wealthy people had lots of wives. They had harems. And so they would castrate somebody and their sex drive would be removed. And then they could be trusted to be over the women of the house. They could also be trusted over the affairs of the house, over the money of the house. Because their masters knew that if they breached that trust, those eunuchs had no place to go. Because eunuchs were almost universally shunned by the rest of culture or society. So in a way, they had marked them, they had branded them, they had done something to them that they now owned them. And this eunuch who had been through that, who had served as master, who would have been shunned by many people in his world, is on his way, the same road, and he comes into contact with Philip. And Philip lovingly shares the gospel with this man. He baptizes him. And the two go their separate ways, never to meet again. I love the story of Philip. That's only two-thirds of it. There's another third I won't tell today. But the contrast between those two divine appointments is so stark. You have this place of great prestige and great influence and great honor in his first divine appointment. And then you have this place where he served and loved and led the one to the Lord that everyone else would have shunned. And from that story, we can make the application that we never get to pick who our divine appointments are going to be with church. Sometimes you're with people of influence. And sometimes they're with those that the world would shun, but we don't get to pick. And we never measure them or we never evaluate them by the standards of the world. And while there are people that might tend to shun those that are less than, there are those that are egotistical in our world and maybe they have a higher view of themselves than they should be. That's not Calvary of the Bible. We're just ordinary people, aren't we? So I think that I think the thing that we probably struggle with the most is the feeling that we have something to share with people in positions of power and influence. I think that's the thing that you wrestle with. You think, I don't have anything to share with them. Look at my life. I'm uneducated on this, on that. I'm not an expert in the Bible. That's the thing that we tend to wrestle with more than the other side of it, isn't it? But Jesus told his disciples you will stand before governors and kings on account of me. He told fishermen that. Ain't no fisherman going to stand before a governor and a king unless it's the divine appointment of God. There's so many stories in the Bible where God used just ordinary men. Nehemiah, Daniel, David, just ordinary men, and he put them in the presence of people of greatness. I look at some of your lives and I know some of your stories and you just think about how did I end up here? How did I end up in this office with that guy standing before me? How did I end up in this position? How did I end up in this place where I get to share with that person of great influence? How? God puts you there. It's a divine appointment. He wants to use you. You don't get to pick your divine appointments. I would just pray over you that you would not see yourself through your own eyes, but you would see yourself through the eyes of Jesus. He wants to speak through you. Amen? The third story I want to tell you is the story of Joseph. Many of you know the story of Joseph, how he was falsely accused, and he ended up in that prison in Egypt and because he was in that prison in Egypt he uh, because of his character in that prison in Egypt he actually ended up having a role of responsibility in the prison God's favor was on Joseph even in that place and because he had this responsibility in the prison he was able to interact with the other prisoners nobody else got that privilege but Joseph got that privilege And he's in this prison, and he meets these two guys that used to be uh, working for Pharaoh. I mean, they were on the inside with 
the king, the pharaoh, over all of Egypt. But they did something to make him mad. He throws him in jail. One was his head chef. The other was his cupbearer. And Joseph gets to know these guys. He's going through, doing his rounds one morning. And these guys have both had a troubling dream the night before. Different dreams, both, both had troubling dreams. And they begin to tell Joseph about their dream. And it's in a prison when Joseph had his first divine appointment. How many want that? Like, no, let's have it on the outside. But that's where God did it. And they, Joseph says, well, tell me your dream and I'll interpret it. And Joseph hears their dream. Well, the, the interpretation for the chef wasn't so good. He was going to die right away. But the interpretation for the cupbearer was that within three days, he was going to be restored to his position working for Pharaoh. You know, the godfather of Egypt, the guy that was in charge of everything. And so Joseph gives him that interpretation, and at the end of it, he tells the cupbearer, he says, and remember me when it goes well with you. And you can read Joseph's mind in that little verse. There's no question that Joseph understood this was a divine appointment, right? I'm in prison. I've got responsibility no one else has. I meet prisoners no one else can, can meet. I can interpret dreams. Lo and behold, I run into a guy that's going to go to work for Pharaoh. I interpret his dream. He goes back to work for Pharaoh. He's in this place of great influence. This must be God's working in my life for my benefit, right? You can just see that. That's what we would think. Remember me when you go talk to Pharaoh because I've been falsely accused and I need out of here as well. But the Bible says in the very next verse, in the very next chapter, that the cupbearer did not remember Joseph, he forgot him. <laughs> Joseph must have thought, what in the world? I was obedient. I was faithful. I know it's your divine appointment, God. I did what you told me to do. I interpreted the dream. And nothing, nothing for one year, nothing for two years. He just sat in that prison. The disappointment must have haunted him. And finally, at the end of two years, the cupbearer remembered Joseph and the will of God was revealed. But as I thought about the story of Joseph, I thought about how many times we have those divine appointments and there's just mysteries to them. Things we don't understand. And when we're in those places and things happen that we don't understand, church, we've got to be careful not to overinterpret them into becoming something God never attend, intended to have happen. We just have to leave the mysteries to the Lord. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to God, not to you. So we have to trust him. A year and a half ago, exactly almost, I had two divine appointments on the same day. The first was I was in a skybox with the owner of Chick-fil-A. The owner of Chick-fil-A is a billionaire. And uh, it wasn't like I just bumped into him. I was in this skybox for a whole football game. My brother-in-law is on his executive committee. And uh, so I'm just hanging out there with Dan Cathy, the owner of the whole thing. He's a strong Christian. And while I was in the same skybox, hanging out with this group of people way over my pay grade, man, I, I come around the corner and standing right in front of me is Andy Stanley. Well, some of you don't know who Andy Stanley is, but he's a big deal in Christianity. He, he pastors either the biggest church in America or one of the biggest churches in America. And so I'm just standing there and pretty soon it's just me and Andy Stanley. Everybody else is kind of doing their own thing. And so I decided I would just engage him in conversation and I just asked him a few questions questions about his children and then I just listened and pretty soon Andy Stanley's just telling me all this stuff it's a great lesson right there church if you want favor with somebody just ask him a question about their kids and then listen stop talking don't tell him about your kids don't tell him your story just listen he told me stuff about his kids that I am sure most people in that room didn't know. And I had this divine appointment with this guy. And I'm sure that God is going to use that. Surely 
Andy Stanley needs me to come speak in his church, right? Don't you think so? The church of thousands? I know that's what God's going to do. And Dan Cathy, the owner of Chick-fil-A, every, I think it's Monday, he gathers everyone in their corporate headquarters that wants to come, and he literally flies pastors in to lead devotions for that group of people. I'll do that, right? Surely that's what the Lord had in mind. I mean, why else would I be there? I didn't orchestrate it, so God orchestrated it. He must be up to something, but church, nothing. My phone has never rang. I'll be in Atlanta next weekend. My son will be here to speak, and I'm taking some business cards with me this time. So my, my phone number is going to be on the front and on the back of those things. Here you go. You, like, I'm going to help God out with my divine appointments. That's not how they work. They all have mysteries to them. We don't get to pick the end. We just share what God would have us share. The last divine appointment that I want to share from the Bible. There are lots, but it's when Peter and John went to the temple. They run into this guy that's there at the gate. That's where beggars would hang out the gate. They could stay there. They see this guy begging. He's been lame from birth. He's never walked in his life. And he's asking for help, money. And you know the famous statement. Peter looked at him and he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee to thee in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. It's, it's a great encounter. It's a miraculous divine appointment. But there's kind of a backstory to that. While it's true that Jesus sent the disciples out to heal while he was with them here on the earth, he did it at least twice. You know that more often than not, the disciples were more of a hindrance than a help to Jesus, right? They were always doing something. They were always saying something. They were always sticking their foot in their mouth. They, they wanted to call down fire from hell or from heaven on those who didn't believe. They, they wanted to rebuke those who were healing in Jesus' name that weren't part of their group. They wanted to run the children off. They were full of another spirit, not the Holy Spirit, right? You know that. They were more of a hindrance than a help. And then when they were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, something changed. And they began to recognize their divine appointments like never before. And we're back where we started. If we're going to recognize the divine appointments that God has for you, we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. As we said two weeks ago, we have to be reminded of the things that Jesus did and he said. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. We have to have that fruit in our lives. I was reading a book yesterday that's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And it describes the fruit of the Spirit in terms of the power of the fruit of the Spirit, the, the power of joy. If there's, if there's something that, that is so attractive that our world must see, it's joy in our lives. I'll teach on that in a couple of weeks. But the power of the joy of the Holy Spirit in our lives is so attractive. If you, you will have people coming to you if we have the joy of the Lord. We don't have to teach you how to smile. We don't have to teach you how to win friends and, and influence people. We just have to have the Holy Spirit continually filling us. And we will have people attracted to us. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us long-suffering. Long-suffering is that <clears throat> refusal to get even when you have every right to. You're just not going there. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us the power of patience, a supernatural patience. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us those gifts. It's the Holy Spirit that so tenderly and carefully excavates the decay in our lives so that we can reflect Jesus as we're supposed to. We can't recognize our divine appointments if we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> What's the purpose behind all of this? It's that you would live differently. I'll just tell you how it is, right? That I would live differently that the world would see us respond in a different way. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. In Matthew 13 and 
the parable of the tares, uh, Jesus tells the parable, and then a little bit later on, he explains the meaning of the parable to his disciples. And he said that the sower of the seed is Jesus. He says that the field is the earth, and he says the seeds that are sown are the sons of the kingdom. It's you and I. God wants to sow us into the world. He wants to sow us, the good seed, into the kingdom. We are put into the kingdom to grow and to reproduce and to shine the light on this dark world that's all around us. We're not called to engage the battle as others engage it. We're called to engage it differently. Amen. How many want to be used of the Holy Spirit in divine appointments? I do. How many are a little bit timid about that? Like, I'd like to, but I'm not sure, right? I get that. We've all been there. So, Father, I just pray over this house that we would grow in our faith that we would grow in our confidence and we would grow in our capacity to be used by you in this wonderful thing lord i've never participated in a divine appointment even when i didn't understand it i've never participated in one where i didn't walk away and just wasn't filled with faith and joy and confidence so, Lord, I pray that we would begin to seek those things, to look for them, to recognize them. Holy Spirit, would you fill us? In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. I pray that you have a great week.